this and I love the talk. Uh, well, that's part of the story with uh, Yocto. So um, today I will talk a little bit about Yocto, um, maybe a little bit about motivation of this, of this talk. Uh, in the last year we had the first automotive buff. I don't know if it's the first automotive buff ever, but well, it's uh, automotive to get, uh, get me more into focus. And in that area we are talking lots of times about Yocto and how to make Yocto use it easier with KDE applications. And I thought it's maybe a good idea to explain what Yocto is, since it's, uh, in my opinion, really hard to get from the internet what it is, how to use it, and what it's for. So, a um, little bit about me. Um, my nick is Kola on the IRC. You can find me in several channels. I am around for some time. Um, I did a PhD in the algorithmic game theory. At that time I was mostly active in KDE. And then started at, uh, an agriculture company who is doing big tractors and harvesters and forage harvesters and the implements for them. And mostly of my, most of my Yocto knowledge is coming from that time where I'm working professionally with Yocto. And I will tell you in a second what Yocto means. Um, so typical things I'm faced with in my work environment uh, are well, Yocto build systems. I'm using a lot of Qt, C++, and um, going deep into the availed Linux. So really, well, getting something work on a interesting hardware. And uh, a lot about, well, ARM devices uh, that we are having on our desks. Uh, what I plan for this talk is to give you a really well, short overview about Yocto to understand what are the main, um, main tools in Yocto, how it can be used, and to give you a starting point if you want to dig deeper. The reason why I'm not trying to do any well, on the fly coding and giving you examples is that typical Yocto um, training takes about four to five days. It's a really really a steep learning curve when you're starting with that system. But at the end, well, you know what you are doing, but it's complex stuff you are facing. Okay, um, I want to start with some basic notions and uh, things that we often, well, simply use and I want to explain what it is. There's an artificial picture I found on the internet um, and I only took this one since there are some well names of the interface on it. So I don't have I don't even know that uh, the render really would be good. So um, we're talking about ECUs that are embedded control units. So essentially it's a computer you are putting in some box and then you are putting it into your machine. Or maybe it can also well a cell phone. Um, so it's it's a specific device that is often really customized for the use case you want to use it for. For example, if you have um, an con automotive control unit in a car or a tractor or so on, you want to have certain uh, connectivities, like you all want to have CAN bus access, since CAN bus is the, the main um, uh, uh, communication system on um, vehicles. You probably also want to have Ethernet, however we are not talking about the 100 base TX Ethernet you are knowing from your laptop, it's a more 100 base T1, which is an automotive grade Ethernet, this, um, which differs a little bit on the uh, physical layer. You want to have uh, serial connections, since a lot of, well, all ECUs only have serial connections, and uh, you're facing this legacy hardware in the system that you somehow have to connect. You have NAND memory that you directly access without some um, controller like you have with a USB card. And a lot of more things uh, you have on a custom hardware. And that is always a really important point. We are talking about a custom hardware that is often designed for the use case where you want to use it. And so you have hardware developing, de development during um, your software development. And hardware development takes a lot of time. I never saw it be less than a year Hopefully it's less than two years, and at the beginning you have a few, pro few prototypes, maybe one, two, or three, that you can use. 
later on, maybe 10, then 50, then 100. Depends on how um, good the, uh, or how uh, finished the hardware is at that time. That also means for your development that often you have only a really few devices that you can use to test your software. And that's a real problem. Since you are developing software that must run very efficiently on a Bell device, but you don't have it. Or you only have one or two to, uh, for testing purposes. Um, so the hardware really evolves. And possibly also the hardware, well, hardware parts inside the, uh, the target device changes over time. Um, you also might have a custom question process, or that's really often. Like um, you're only uh, doing full system updates where you, from somewhere, are loading the whole root file system and updating it. Or you have uh, another custom system where you want to update it. So it's not like a typical Linux system where you update the packages one after each other. At least often it's not so everybody. Um, usually you have different hardware you, want to, you are developing on than the hardware you are de developing for. So if you often is an ARM device, and I think most of us don't have an ARM device for your main development. So uh, you are building, you are creating a software on an x86 device and building it for an ARM device. And so you are also faced with the problem that you have um, cross-building food chain. So building one architecture for another architecture. And well, in this talk, I'm only talking about uh, Linux operating systems, and I'm not talking about real time. Um, the issue, I want to talk about this, this talk, or the issue statement, uh, Yocto tries to solve, is the following. Um, let's assume we have a specific ECU we want to develop software for. That means we want to have a, the full system image that we can flash afterwards <coughs> on the image. So maybe at the end of the line, when you are really in production, or your system image that you update late, later on. The system image shall contain the applications and the libraries that you want to flash. And it's important that no magic happens, so uh, that it's really a reproducible build. You can start it again and again and again, and you get always the same results, hopefully without getting arbitrary sources from the internet. And it must be also really well defined. If you maybe get some reliability years after from the TÜV, it's also possible there. And we are working on an x86 machine. And this talks about how Yocto tries to solve it. And I'm still not really getting to Yocto, or well, to the techniques, but I'm getting more to what Yocto is. Yocto isn't really a tool. Yocto is um, an organization, a project that uses several tools. I have found this really nice quote from the Yocto project. Um, the Yocto project is an open source co collaboration project that provides templates, tools, and methods to help you create custom Linux-based systems for embedded and IoT products, regardless of the hardware architecture. So that is what they want to do. And they are gathering tools from several areas and creating an ecosystem where this is made simple. Since in the years before, we were faced with arbitrary build systems from your hardware vendor, where you are stacking, where you are stuck with one specific vendor and their build system, and you couldn't simply change to another one. And that's also, well, also an open source, we, we, we really don't like that. Um, so the Yocto project tries for making each ecosystem for making device creation simple, to provide all tools that you need for doing the job, for creating such image, and to reuse what you did. Um, a few basic notions that are extremely important to your crew are the following four. A recipe is mainly the, the, the most, one of the most fundamental elements of your crew. It's uh, like a recipe for cooking a sauce bolognese. You, are, you have a few in key, uh, ingredients that you need, and you have steps you, you have to do. And at the end, you get a result. So that's a uh, these are recipes for building software. From how to get the source code, how to modify it, how to build it, how to get the result, and how to package it. Um, a layer, in the Yocto sense, is a group of recipes. So several recipes that are shipped together. But there's a little bit more. It's uh, not only the group, 
it's um, well the na name already names it. Um, we have layers on top of each other, and that's um, one of the biggest strengths of the uh, Yocto system. That um, right, I have these group of recipes that I stack on each other, and that also means that a higher priority layer can adapt lower priority layers. For example, if you have uh, a build recipe for a certain library that is not working for a certain architecture you are working on, then you can add a patch to a higher priority layer, so append the recipe, and modify it in a well-defined way. And getting, um, well, you have adaptations in, or maybe your uh, specific patches you need. Um, then the image, I'm talking always about the root file system image. So if you're going to a Linux PC and doing ls at root, that's what I mean. And that I want to have one big file that I can put onto my uh, mail device. And we are talking about SDKs, so I have a specific slide for. Um, what's a little bit confusing about Yoktu is um, that Yoktu uses a lot of uh, well, open embedded software, or that information are distributed between Yoktu and open embedded on the internet. And the reason is that open embedded is much older. Open embedded came from guys who uh, made. Um, yeah, made systems that ran on uh, power computers, and they looked a lot about, looked into the uh, cost building process and the tooling, and they did a really good job, and they are really good results that are simply reused in the Yocto project. And there are two crucial things that I will show at this in the next slide. One is Open Embedded Core, and one is Bitbake. Bitbake is the building tooling, Open Embedded Core is the metadata you need for, uh, for building. So, um, in a nutshell, what Open Embedded Core is, it um, defines the uh, crucial bits for your cross compilation. So, it defines uh, it, it's how essential tasks are performed, like uh, how to obtain source code. And that's not as simple as it takes, uh, as it sounds. It's uh, different, uh, different when you are getting source code from Git, from SVN, from a tarball. Um, there are several ways how to obtain source code. So um, there are tasks defined how to configure source code, for example, with CMake, how to set up build, build dependencies, how to define what is, depend, what is required before you can build a certain part of software. And of course, the whole compilation process, how to trigger CMake, how to trigger QMake, how to trigger auto tools. And there, that's extremely complicated to uh, get everything of the typical tools working. Um, also, how to populate a sysroot, which is um, the target system, but put onto your x86 system in one subfolder that you can use to uh, temporarily store everything you need to build for your target. And also quality issues checks. Moreover, it brings you um, a lot of these recipes I talked about. So for the essential things, like you need a GCC, for, for example, to build something, so you need a recipe for that. That's crucial. You must build the libc, otherwise how can the system work? Debus, and there are a lot of things you often want to use, and these are also already provided with Open Embedded Core. And they provide uh, already several platforms, so uh, you can go to R, MIPS, PowerPC, of course x86, and which is really important, to Kimo. So you have already an emulator that is supported, for which, which is an architecture for which you can build and test your software. Secondly, um, we have Bitbag. Bitbag is a very complex bit build system that takes all the layers and the recipes and creates your image. It does it by, well, you are defining a list of, you're defining which uh, layers you want to use. It passes all of them. It also looks at the higher priority layers and appends recipes from lower priority layers gets a set of final recipes that we are getting by this layered technique, and then tests all the possible tasks. And then it looks what you want to do. And probably you have built the core image for my device. And then you have some libraries and applications defined there. And Bitbake goes to the tree back and looks what is required to get this image done. And all these tasks are then scheduled in Bitbake and run one after each other. So for example, if you want to build K-Archive, of course you must build uh, Qt, Qt Core before. 
and you must first download the source code before configuring it. So they are simple tasks, and well, it's not that complicated to, to schedule it in a naive way, but it's a lot of work to do by a bit big, and it's, uh, it takes hours, real hours. Um, I have projects that have from four to 7,000 packages that must be built, and it's about 50 gigabytes, and um, four or five hours on my eight-core 32 gigabit machine, since you are building everything from scratch. That's, well, not nice for the developer, but really important here. Um, then, well, now we have the build tool, we have the core definition, third thing that's of course missing is the distribution, so how to put, put everything together. And there are several ways, for example, there's Pokey, that is something that, that is directly uh, provided by the Opto project, so reference distribution, how to, um, well, yeah, how uh, the whole system, the target system should look like. You can use it as, um, as a blueprint to create your own distribution. You can, well, adapt it. You can also use other ones. For example, the automotive grade Linux Linux team can tell you a lot about, is also an alternative. But these are the things that, these things that are provided by Yocto. So it's a, a set of tools, a set of definitions, and a way how to create an, an image. And the power of, of the Yocto system is that a lot of uh, Big companies support it and also support their layers, or the, the layers that are needed. For example, you get uh, Texas Instruments layer, you get uh, NXP layers, you get um, all the hardware adaptations from the big companies. So you don't have to do it since we have a common set of, uh, yeah, we have a common language how to define that. The quality may vary, but uh, it's there. A last point for, uh, to the basics, um, SDKs are an extremely important point is, uh, that's a real strength, strength of your tool that you can automatically generate a software development kit with your definition. The software development, uh, development kit contains everything to start a cross building. So it's something you can install, like uh, the NDK or SDK if you're, uh, the Android SDK if you're familiar with Android. Um, and that you can give an arbitrary developer, and the developer can use it and create software cross compiled for the target device. That's useful if you don't want to uh, give Yoc to in the hands of every developer to create its own system. It's also useful if you want to share responsibilities. It's also useful in commercial context where you don't uh, want to disclose all of your source code. And um, what's also extremely nice here is. Um, that if you have a standardized way how to create a software development kit, you can use that to um, set up the build tooling. At work, we are using ways to uh, configure um, Sheet Creator automatically. For We get an arbitrary Yocto to SDK, and we set it up by script. I bet we can um, get it, uh, the same in KDevelop to uh, also get the same experience, which is really nice since you are having all you only have another target where you build from, you run it, and on your target, the software runs, which is uh, nice. Um, a typical Yocto system, since I talk a lot about it, could look like this. So we have a set of layers, the boxes here. So um, we have Pokey as a distribution. Pokey already contains um, open embedded core, with all the meter information, and the basic definitions of our tasks are supposed to be done. It um, create, uh, contains pitch bake. And on top of that, you can add arbitrary uh, other layers. For example, you will probably need um, the speed layer, so a board support package layer from the hardware vendor of the new device you're developing for. For example, the metered TI from Texas Instruments, or the meter FSL, or there are other ones, depending on the board you're working for. Um, then you have for sure a custom layer where you figure where you co configure everything together what you want to have in your final system. So what shall be, shall be installed onto your system, uh, onto your image? So the libraries and applications and the system D scripts for or system D services for starting up your system and so on. Everything configured and that's good practice to put it in a separate layer. 
And then you can extend it with other functionality. There's, for example, the meta cube file layer, if you want to have cute, which I guess you want. And I guess you also want to have meta k file, which provides you all the most recent uh, KDE frameworks file layers. And if you want to have Plasma running on it, you can use meta KDE. And so you have a set of different layers that you put together and tell Yoktu, I want to have this result. Yoktu passes the recipes, creates the build tree, builds everything, and provides you the system image that you can flash at the end at the at your board. And well, that's what I already talked about uh, on the last slide. Well, but, uh, if you have been in forecast talk um, this afternoon, we now have um, a really recent set of uh, the Meta K5 recipes that are updated every release of KE Frameworks 5, where you have updated recipes to build. So the nice thing is for um, um, an integrator or developer for a target device, you only have to say, I download the Meta K5 repository, I add one line to my configuration, and I add one line since I want to have K archive. And then everything done is done automatically. And it's extremely simple to integrate. And that's uh, the real power of the system. Um, I'm not that familiar with the uh, Plasma desktop, but I think uh, Plasma Mobile is uh, mostly is completely running the shell, but no applications yet. So um, you're welcome to add applications. Most importantly, the Kirigami applications to make it really nice. But um, that's a really good um, showcase if you want to show that your device is working with Valent and um, all the nice things are working. It's not, uh, well, the rendering is okay, which is more, most of the time the, the most critical part. So, that was a really quick view. Uh, well, round trip about what is Yocto and how to use Yocto, or uh, how Yocto can be used, but I really didn't go into it how to, you really could start. And that's what um, some years ago took also a lot of time for me to go to the internet and see, well, Yocto, how do I start? And um, I tried to get, give a small starting procedure how it might be a good idea to start with Yocto. First of all, there's a really good quick start guide. I put the link at the slide, and you already saw at the beginning there at the conference website. That's a nice way to uh, well download a few sources, configure Bitbake, run it, wait some hours, then you have a result, and you can put you can put it into an emulator and see if it works. And that's the uh, first important step to get it building, so you know somehow it's working. So. so Second, really important step, and it's always uh, the important step in a major development, development, is to bring it onto the target hardware. Since at that time, always strange things will happen. It's always the same. Often you will on see nothing, a black screen, no network connection are working, and you have to connect with USB to serial adapter to get your TTY0 somehow access and see what the uh, kernel output messages are at the beginning to, to really understand what is going wrong. But um, that is, in my opinion, the second step. First get your to running in emulator, then go to target hardware and best use some, well, where there are already working solutions like Raspberry Pi, for example, or <coughs> BeagleBone. You can go directly to automotive and use an IMX6. There are also working distributions, um, wherever you have other uh, shortcomings there. And then you can really start playing around with it. And that's uh, use MetaQt5 and create a small QML application running full screen. Um, maybe starting already a QValent compositor and putting some windows in it. And it's looking cool. It's really, really cool feeling the first time you see a picture on your mail device. And then MetaK5, MetaKDE, put everything together and while you have your first integrated device. The whole problem is it's a really steep learning curve and there is ext an extreme big amount of uh, documentation which is, I think, good to understand if you're really deep in it, 
and at the beginning it's hard. And it really takes a long time. That's the downside of it. Wherever it's um, currently, I think, one of the industry standards we use, and that's a really good point to have an open source tooling for creating embedded devices, and where even the uh, commercial companies are participating. And um, yeah, the Qt company is supporting the Meta K Qt 5 layer, we are supporting the Meta K5 layer, and so it's much easier than years ago to, to integrate a, a device. Okay, I also added one page of references, I won't read them, that I, I think one of uh, the most important starting point if you want to read something, especially the Yocto project documentation, that's a website where you see a lot of links for the quick start guide, for the full reference, for the big back reference, and one thing I just remembered, if you ever have problems with Bitbag, look for Bitbag layers. I'm not sure if it's in there. Okay, that's all I wanted to tell, and I'm happy to take questions. creation, I'm not sure. Well, for every package you are creating, you are um, well, building it, you are splitting the package into smaller packages. For me, it's really similar to what Debian is doing, so splitting step. And then you are populating uh, the, this route. And I think it's always taking the recent, most recent versions, as long as they didn't change. If you're doing weird stuff, it's, well, you get um, a dirty system that we have to clean, but uh, well, it's um, really installing it uh, and extracting the files into the system. Uh, I'm not wrong. So the, 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 um, the layering doesn't the layering doesn't happen on like a file system level, but like conceptually on the uh, recipe metadata. Yeah, so it's basically on the on the input to the system, not on the output. I do it on the uh, Yeah. yeah. So the layering system is really a configuration layering system to um, well make it easy to make adaptations to uh, other layers. So you should never get to the situation where you change a recipe from a layer that you make uh, make an append. So you have it well documented in a separate layer that that you want to change something. And well, if it's something bulky or really done, uh, really uh, at the crucial steps. Uh, Below, then you should try to change it there. Since uh, in the end, uh, you will get problems if you get patches there. And but it's really configuration. That's comparable to the ASP, basically, to the build system of Arch. I'm yeah, not familiar. Familiar. I'm only I know if, uh, okay. how Debian uh, building is working, but not Arch. Okay. Maybe it's similar. Okay, thanks. No, at, at least I know which language it's written. Any more questions? Well, this is not a question, but I, I just want to highlight um, uh, that uh, the work that Volker and Andrea are doing open, open can be uh, a huge door to uh, an audience that has never uh, seen the kind of work that we've seen uh, based in open source, that uh, to industries that are actively looking for creative development so the developer, application developer assistance, it opened us the door for uh, companies that have been traditionally very closed source and they are getting into open source, uh, companies that have been uh, to environments in where, where Qt is the king, um, 
So I think we have a lot to offer in many of those industries. And I also think that uh, it would be a great area for KDE to get into the spotlight again and, and bring a lot of energy from, from people that do not have and that do not know what we have and what we know. So I would like to see more and more people like these guys uh, putting effort on that, reducing the gap, and then going to these big corporations and getting some money from them to close that gap. But that's a different story. First, I have a non-technical question. Uh, are you using the Qt embedded runtime licensing scheme, the commercial Qt? Uh, well, depends. I, here I'm uh, well, on my own with my KDE head on it, <laughs> and then I'm for sure using only open source. So using the open source version on the embedded system? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's interesting for me. I, I oh yeah, from the the, 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 yep. the foundation, and mm -hmm. um, it's always the topic comes up. Um, what is embedded? Because it's supposed to be runtime exactly. licenses, which is totally but different from developer licenses. And but you're using the open source version yes. on the embedded system. And um, well, uh, from the um, from the notes from Olaf, I still uh, still wanted to, to ask where's the difference? What, what is uh, in the uh, non-desktop Linux? Uh, well, license agreement with Qt. Since uh, for me, the, uh, uh, the, the embedded space is not covered by our agreement, so it's not okay. subject to the foundation. Well, it, uh, it works. Yes, it's, it's the same. same. Yeah. Technically, it's the same. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. If I may ask a totally different question, I'm really wondering how you want to, with this approach you're doing, which basically is creating images that can flash on the system, it's cool, but how do you want in the long term um, handle the, the life cycle? Yeah, there are many, many different devices out there in the world, and these machines, they run up to 20 years in the field. And how do you want to, especially uh, with all these many upstream projects, how do you want to deal with that, uh, especially with regards to security? And last but not least, are your devices locked down? Can I hack on them? That's a really big, really big question. Um, but that's usually, well, here we are providing infrastructure, and that's a question for the, uh, the people who are integrated and bring it into the market. Um, for the updating process, for sure you need some specific system like well, uh, two partitions or three partition system where you flash onto one partition and then switch the partitions and go back if something goes wrong. Maybe with a golden image where you can fall back if everything breaks down that you don't have to send a field technician. Um, with the lockdown, that's a completely different story. As far as I know, uh, nobody yet tried in the automotive sector to uh, do it really with um, GPLSV or LGPL uh, stuff. I, technically, it should be possible. I'm not sure how it should be legally, but that's um, something I can, really cannot answer or comment. So you are locking down or not? Well, the Raspberry Pis we have here are not locked down. No, I have the glass if I have one of these machines. Will I have access to the kernel? Can I change the kernel? Can you do a security update? Well, uh, that I cannot say. Uh, that's for me not to say, and uh, I private here. Uh, well, I... Maybe it's different from different yeah. companies. So no, I'm wondering yeah. how it's with glass. That's, that's a, it's a simple question, actually. Yeah, it's but... An embedded. I mean, isn't, isn't, isn't the, the definition of embedded that uh, uh, the application comes with the hardware? That's, a, that's, the, that's what I've heard, that that's the definition of embedded. Hey, you, you know the story. Okay. Yeah, but, but, yeah. <laughs> but I think we, well, we all know the story how the GPL came and how Richard yep. Foreman started his project. It was not about a, a PC, it was about a printer. Yeah, yeah. but here we are talking about, um, well, what I just said, it's an open source license. It's for private area. They don't have a commercial license. Company, we have commercial license for sure. And well, I don't know anybody who tried it yet with uh, open source licenses. And for sure, I know the uh, terrorization rules and the problems. Yeah, sure. But uh, here I'm how to explain how to. This is the last question. We're already 10 minutes.
from my list, so the LGPL in general, uh, when you want to use the LGPL version, you can't lock down the device. And you have to provide instructions on how you can exchange two libraries and use open source libraries. That's simple. Yeah, sure. Story. That's simple. So so that's why a lot of automotive companies don't like to uh, write this instruction uh, by the commercial license. That's the reason for LGPSV and GPSV. And that's also the reason why VSKDE supported that the KDE Cute Free Software Foundation got uh, went away to um, LGPSV and GPSV. Yes. Okay. Um, let's have a round of applause once again. Okay.